Amen. Well, thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, everybody, for turning out on this hot morning. Um, and can I just say thank you to, to the fantastic PowerPoint team, tech team at the back there, and uh, amplification team. Uh, yeah. Believe me, as a, you know, when you go around speaking at things, you really do notice things like that, and we owe them a huge uh, debt of gratitude. Thanks, guys. Well, this week, we need no reminding that our faith places the call to gratitude at the very center of formation in Christ. Enter, enter his gates with thanksgiving implores the psalmist. And yet, and yet, it's not an easy discipline, is it? When we're battling against the odds, struggling to make a, a life, a godly life in a fallen world, gratitude. I, my mother had uh, rheumatic heart disease as a child. She'd, she was told she would never have children and she got married, uh, and they had a first pregnancy. And you can imagine the surprise and the joy and the blessing that that was, and she carried that child to full term, and he was still born. Of course, in days without a modern technology when that might have been picked up, and she was absolutely devastated. And they arrived home, and my father, wanting to bring words of comfort, thought he'd put on a hymn. And so he got out a record, dusted it off, and put it on the old record player, and out it came. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And you'd imagine how that went down a lead balloon. Count my blessings, she said. If you, when it comes to counting my blessings right now, you don't need many fingers. And it was well-intentioned. And I'd imagine at some time or other, most of us have felt a bit like that, haven't we? Not all the time, no, but, but some of the time. When life goes dark, it can be hard to see what kind of a God would heap yet more pain into a human life, let alone expect them to be grateful for it. Maybe some of us are in that place now. Can I just say it's okay to feel like that? The psalmist modeled the cry of despair. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And of course, C.S. Lewis captured the progression from sad to mad, angry in his famous line in his own wrestling and struggle with his grief. He wrote this, but go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, Silence. He could have added, and then don't forget you're supposed to say thank you. Thank you. Or maybe your problem isn't so much to do with your situation, it's to do with your personality. Your personality, you, you, you find it hard to see the good stuff. They learn to be grateful for it. Your mind just works in ways that seem disposed to seeing the glass half empty. By the way, my wife did remind me that I got that the wrong way around yesterday, if you were here. Um, she said, Glyn, you're not a half full person, you're a half empty person. So I said I would correct that this morning, as she felt I should. <laughs> but you see, if, if they knew some of the things that had happened in your life, the pain and the abuse, perhaps, Maybe they'd understand why you're built that way a little more. You've learned to be on your guard. A dangerous world. You've learned the hard way. It pays to be cautious. 
So it's easy to talk about gratitude. It rolls off the tongue. But in a fallen world, is it for real? What if Bart Simpson was right when it came to his turn to say grace before supper? Dear God, we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. (laughs) Nevertheless, while keeping these realities in mind, I'm going to make the case that despite these caveats in the grand scheme of the Christian life, gratitude is strong medicine for the soul. I'm going to explore this under three broad headings. Uh, The hallmarks of gratitude first, the benefits of gratitude, and the disciplines of gratitude. Okay, what are the hallmarks of gratitude? Two things here. It is a chosen posture of the mind. It is an attitude towards circumstances, not a reaction to them. Okay, let's take those in turn. It is a chosen posture of the mind, not a situational emotion. Biblical gratitude is not a natural response to a situation when good things happen. We all know that situations change. No one feels grateful for when you've just lost your job or you're gearing up for a fractious church committee meeting, or watching your child slip further into an illness that terrifies you. How could you? But biblical gratitude isn't a situational feeling. It is a chosen posture toward life. It is an act of obedience to the summons to come before his presence with thanksgiving. Easy? No. Two reasons. Because of the fallen heart. Ingratitude is the natural disposition of the fallen heart. Romans 1.21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. But in their thinking became futile. Hearts were darkened. Even those unexpectedly flooded with grace find it hard to remember, to be grateful, don't they? What happened after the healing of the ten lepers? Jesus says, we're not all ten cleansed to the one who comes back, but where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise except this foreigner? So why, why do we find it so hard in, in our fallenness? Because... I think a couple of things here too. To come before his presence with thanksgiving is to embrace the truth that we are creatures, that we are dependent, that our next breath depends on his good will. And friends, rebellious, sinful creatures find that hard to swallow. So we've developed inbuilt defenses against thankfulness and seeing grace. And then, of course, in, in, a, in a world broken by sin, in a fallen world, it does pay to see the bad stuff. One of the world's leading researchers on the psychology of gratitude, Raymond, uh, Robert Eamon, says, quote, the human mind is powered by mental tools that appear to work against the ability to see grace let alone respond with gratitude. Why? Because in a fallen world, it pays to be suspicious. When the phone call comes in from the bank asking you to move your account, it pays to be suspicious. It pays to keep your phone in your pocket when walking through central London on a dark night. And we'll spend... Thursday's seminar, actually, looking at the power of bad in our lives because it's deeply woven into our psyche and how we as Christians, what we can do to defend against that and flourish in that. But returning to gratitude, these factors, the inward turn of the human heart as a result of sin, the power of bad in our lives, they help us understand why gratitude doesn't come easily. It has to be a chosen posture of the heart, an exercise of the mind in the face of emotions that tell us otherwise. Plenty of examples in scripture of this. 
Alexander, Habakkuk 3.17, one of the most precious, moving, heart-searching verses in the entire Bible. The fig tree does not um, the, the, the fig tree does not grow, and there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive trees uh, and fields produce no food, that there are no sheep. <laughs> Sorry, can I tell you what I've done? I dictated this verse into my um, into here at a later time, and my dear voice translator didn't pick this one up so well. So let's try it again. Here we go. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Psalm 69, a harrowing tale of loss and betrayal, of hopelessness and despair. In his mind's eye, the psalmist's troubles loom large and God looms small. And yet, and yet, 69 verse 30, I will magnify him with, with thanksgiving. Okay, so the second point, gratitude is an attitude to life circumstances, not simply a ra- reaction to them. An attitude, not simply a reaction to life circumstances. Grateful feelings follow when good things happen much more naturally. Grateful attitudes precede things that happen, whether good or bad. Gratitude is an attitude. But, of course, we're back to that big but how can we be grateful for bad things happening? I watched a brave Christian woman descend, choking her way into motor neurone disease. I've seen what schizophrenia can do to a good mind. I've watched a dad and his little boys, just three year old, walk down the aisle behind his mum's coffin. We've, we've all been places like that, haven't we? And if we haven't, we will be. How do we give thanks for all circumstances, including these? We are not asked to. Paul, in the most famously relevant verse here, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. When Jesus is confronted with the death of his friend Lazarus, this was not a blessing to be counted. He wept at the cruelty of death. But then notice what comes next when he turns in prayer. Father, I thank you that you have heard me in this situation which will be transformed as a great example of death becoming life in the hands of the Savior of the world. This is Jesus giving thanks in all circumstances. And so gratitude as an attitude finds ways of giving thanks in all circumstances. Friends, we're not a sea in a drift of atheism which tells you you're on your own. You know, there was a few years back a sign put up by, I think, the Secular Society uh, on the side of London buses. There probably is no God. So... Um, relax, I think it was something like that, so relax and enjoy your life, or just get on and enjoy your life, wasn't it? The Christian apologist Francis Spofford says, do you realize really what that's saying? It's saying that when life goes dark, there probably is no God, you're on your own. 
It says that when you're struggling in your grief, not enjoying yourself, you're on your own. It's saying when your best laid plans turn dark and wrong, you're on your own. Not enjoying yourself, tough, you're on your own. That's what atheism does. We are not atheists, we are not consigned to now enjoy your life and get on with your own because we know that we don't always enjoy our lives. But the God of the universe comes alongside in our grief and in our pain, I will never leave you, whose faithfulness is to a thousand generations. And when we can't see through the darkness, we give thanks that nevertheless, he is there. And if it has to be through gritted teeth, we do it because that is the posture to which we're called. You know, my grandfather was a fiery Pentecostal preacher as a young man, but his fieriness wasn't simply a part of his preaching. It was very much a part of his personality. And he had a run-in, he was about 26, with somebody like the flower ladies in church. <laughs> and he stormed out and he said, I'll never set foot in a church again. And he didn't until in his mid-60s, a year before he died, he came back. And I witnessed as a 16-year-old a remarkable transformation. And I always remember him taking me aside and saying, Glyn, you know, I wasted 40 years of my life. Don't do that with yours. And it stayed with me. But nevertheless, I think he experienced a deeper gratitude still, something deeper than his regret, a gratitude that what had been lost had been found. That in his grief for what he'd lost, and yeah, he was gonna be taking hay and strubble stubble and straw into the kingdom, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, to be burned away. But despite all that, in what he'd lost, he'd gained a new, a deeper understanding now, one year before he goes to meet his savior, what it means to be found. How thankful that God gave him that year So those are the hallmarks of gratitude. A chosen posture, not an emotional reaction to life's circumstances, a cognitive attitude to them. Okay. Next point, the benefits of gratitude. You know, one of the principal hazards of, of today's me culture is entitlement, isn't it? Dear God, we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. And our fast-paced, web-based lives leave little time to see and savor grace, because we've barely gotten one thing and we're being nudged that it's already out of date and we need the next thing and we need an upgrade. It's always an upgrade. What you have now is never enough. But a posture of gratitude works against the grain of entitlement in our character. It forces us to slow down, to savor the grace around us. Think of Bart Simpson again. Dear God, we paid for all this stuff, so thanks for nothing. Hey, Bart, hold on a minute. You're holding a glass of English sparkling wine in your hand. Yeah, you paid for it. But think of all that was given to you in the process of its making. Think of the student who traveled down from Estonia to pick it up, to pick it up in the morning early, long before you even begin to stir, Bart, to bring in your harvest. 
Think of the inventive minds that research the technology behind the wine presses, the fermentation, the bottling, the yeast. Did you earn the yeast? Did you pay for the yeast, Bart? that work so hard to turn your grapes into wine, the lorry drivers who drove it through the night as the crates rattled on the back, the woman who smiled at the supermarket checkup. Did you pay for that? Did she need to? The young 16-year-old who just started his training helping load your box of wine into your boot. Thanks for nothing, we paid for it. The assistant who stopped packing the shelves when you asked directions to the wine department, and she took you there. Oh, and it rained that year. How it rained at just the right time for that juice-laden harvest. So many grapes that, that it brought down the price. And you didn't need to pay as much as you'd thought, Bart and the sun that shone, and the plants that grew, and the nervous system right now that coordinates your hand in its ability, this remarkable ability to position your arm into space to pick up this delicate thing and transport it to your mouth. You pay for that? The air you breathe. Be thankful, Bart. Be better than you are. Be more than you are. Slow down, savor the world of grace in which you swim. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So that's a plausible argument, isn't it? But is there any real evidence that this posture is good for us? Well, we know that grateful people experience more positive emotions generally. They tend to have a more rounded sense of their own worth as individuals. There are significant correlations between being a grateful person and having a grateful posture toward life and other positive emotions such as joy, contentment, optimism, compassion, all. People who score higher in terms of grateful disposition tend to be more outgoing, less self-absorbed, and they display lower levels overall of anxiety and depression. Now, of course, because gratitude is correlated, do you remember yesterday? <laughs> with other positive emotions and with benefits in the area of mental and physical disease doesn't mean that gratitude is the cause of them. Nor does it prove that if we cultivate gratitude, then these good things will necessarily follow. It's a correlation. Do you remember? Correlation doesn't equal causation. We don't know what's causing what here, and we certainly don't know whether cultivating gratitude as a discipline produces any positive effects. It may be just a chance association in people who are generally positive anyway. So, we need a trial. And thankfully, um, a psychologist called Robert Amon, who I've already saw, cited, has done one of, the, one of the fairly decent trials in this area. And I think the evidence is beginning to accumulate. Now, what he did was uh, he took a group of subjects and he assigned them to a daily journal and to a period of reflection. By journal, I mean keeping notes and a period of reflection. But he randomly allocated his subjects to be in one of three groups. The first group, they had to journal and reflect on the positive events of their lives that day and intentionally exercise gratitude for them. It was about 20 minutes, half an hour task. It's quite hard to do, a bit like the awe walk we were talking about yesterday. And that was their task. The second group had something different, and this would come more naturally to many of us. They, they had to catalog and then take note of all the daily hassles of their lives. 
the third group were just told to do anything they liked in that time and just think about anything that came to mind and make some notes of the day as it went by, okay? So the first group is really counting its blessings, isn't it? You, you might note, you know, just thankful for the generosity of friends today. Gosh, the right to vote. I've always just done it. I live in a country where I have a vote. That library book I picked up, not many countries you just go and get a book out free. Fresh, fresh tomatoes. What I learned about computing today, the healthy legs that walk me to work. My in-laws only live 10 minutes away. Wonderful. <laughs> and then group two. It was hard to find that parking space as usual once I got to work. Oh, the oven broke down. I got home. Um, do you know how long I was on hold having to cancel that flight? One hour. Ugh, paying my taxes again today, and then I burned the macaroni. Oh, and by the way, my in-laws only live 10 minutes away. <laughs> so what did they find? What he found was significant benefits in that first group. Events, conditions for which we're grateful. He found a range of positive mental health outcomes at three and six months. Subjectively, subjects appeared, not huge gains, there are no miracles in life, everything takes time and works a little bit by little bit, but subjects generally were more enthusiastic, attentive, energetic, determined and resilient. He found that positive recall bias, enhancing encoding of positive, other positive aspects of life experience. Now what does that mean? What it means is that this discipline of Thinking back over the day and picking out the good things trains the mind generally to look for better things and to recall better things that have happened in our lives. This seemed to correlate with better social relationships, fewer stress-related symptoms. Now, when I see rosy data like this, I'm an epidemiologist, the skeptic, links in, and I think, well, how many times has this been replicated? Let's wait and see how these data pan out. I guarantee other studies over time won't sustain the rosiness of this picture. Nevertheless, generally, although these studies aren't easy to carry out, that is the direction of the evidence in general. There are measurable benefits of the discipline of gratitude, cultivating it. And uh, this kind of evidence here is also a gift to us this morning. Let's be grateful for Robert, the work he's doing, because it reminds us that the holy ways that God calls us into are for our good, not for our harm, and for our blessings, and in the long run, they're given for our flourishing as human beings. So they're the benefits of cultivating gratitude in your life. Many of us are toward the older end of life. It's never too late to start. Many of us write, some of us write much earlier on in life. Start now, reap the benefits over those years ahead, everybody. How do we do that? Well, now we're on to the disciplines of gratitude, aren't we? More specifically, how do we become people of gratitude? How do we let go of that sense of entitlement, become more open and thoughtful in giving thanks? How do we change? How do your prayers tend to begin, by the way? You begin with thanks. I'm surprised often how as Christians turn to prayer, we're straight in there with the shopping list. No, the, the context in which the shopping list is brought before God must always be a context, gratitude, submission, acknowledgement, 
thankfulness. So how do we cultivate this? Well, three points. You've got to decide to change. We need to adopt some new habits. And we've got to motivate the elephant. Come back to the elephant in a moment. First of all, you've got to decide to change. As I said yesterday, quite a lot of you are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this, New Year's resolution. It'll last about as long as all the rest of your New Year resolution because change is hard. And you have to want to change, really. And change is hard because sometimes the discontents of the present feel safer, more secure than the opportunities and the risks of the future and the alternative. So you've got, you know, I, I, I sit and over the years I've listened to lots of people unburden themselves. It's been a huge privilege aching wounds, the repeated missteps, the disappointment with God, the struggle with besetting sins. But over and over again as I've listened, inevitably we come to the point where I will ask the question, so do you want to change? Do you want to change? People are a bit surprised by that. You say, after all, I've told you. Do you think I want to change? Actually, sometimes people don't want to change because the security of the pain at least is a security than the risk of moving elsewhere. The benefits of familiarity outrisk the, outweigh the risks of untested waters. I remember, as I said yesterday, everyone who's involved in any kind of pastoral oversight leadership should themselves be under some kind of oversight. And I mentioned that I have two people I report to, and and one of them, uh, I started off actually mentoring him over the years, and as I've got older and he's got older, um, that that role is now reversed. And I was talking about some of my... um, story to him and I think I was talking now I was talking about my father and uh, let's call him George this this man who helps me he said um, Glyn can I can I just ask um, you've mentioned that story over and over again I think you're dining out on it you know He said, I I think you're enjoying telling that story, as painful as it seems, because I hear it all the time. And then he said, do you want to change? Do you really want to? Or are you enjoying the story? Of course, I'm not enjoying the story. It's a painful story. But but there is something about, about sameness, about familiarity. And so this is a serious question. Do you want to become a person marked by gratitude? Do you really want to? Do you want, because if you want to, this is going to take work. It's going to take a plan. It's going to take a long-term commitment. And we call on God, the Holy Spirit, to walk with us through that. So, We need to commit, if we do want to change, to some new habits. There's the habit of noticing. Notice. Notice. Just spot things and try and reframe them. How how long has that tree been there, I wonder? Gosh, beautiful. I wonder what it is put there. We, We passed some hydrangeas yesterday that were shifting color and I just thought for a moment what a gift this gift has fallen into my field of sight just fallen beautiful notice friends these things 
and these things. They don't want to do that because they need our attention to sell on to advertisers, so they'll fight. And so you notice, ding, you know, and now you've stopped noticing, and they say, hey, we need your attention here, followed by this advert. So there are all kinds of devices and tools working against our capacity to notice and then savor the world around us. So I just want to say thanks to the tech team. Do we notice them? Are we thankful? Or do we turn up just thinking that's part of their job? Do we, do we notice e- each other? Do we, do we notice the gifts that people bring into our lives? So what I want to suggest is one possibility we talked about yesterday to open up our minds was awe walks, if you remember. Here's another possibility, and you could do either. Don't try and do them both, because they're both hard work. They take long-term commitment. How about keeping a gratitude diary, a count your blessings diary journal? It'll be hard. Um, And keep it for at least six months every day. And it takes commitment, and it takes time. So I'd suggest that if you did want to do that, you need to ask somebody to help you be accountable to that commitment. A spouse, um, somebody who, who you meet up with and pray with. I've committed to doing this. Would you help hold me to it? Can I report back to you every month? And I, I guarantee some months I'll say, oh, I forgot completely, or I was just too busy, or I was crashed out for several nights on the row. And they'll say, that's all right, but did you then recommit and get back into the groove? And you say, yes, I did. So it, just saying you go, it never, very rarely works. Commit to this process of becoming a person of gratitude. But then finally, and then we're through, we do have to motivate the elephant. <laughs> now, do you remember the, the elephant? I said that the human personality yesterday is like a rider on an elephant. This is after psychologist Jonathan Haidt, by the way. He, I think he first thought of this, so I always try to credit my sources. We're like an elephant with a little rider. Now, the rider on top is the rational side to us, the thinking side. And, and, and it's the rider that says, this makes sense to me. I'm going to try to become a person of gratitude, you see? Now, the elephant, however, doesn't do close-knit arguments. He gets the impression of things. He's emotional, and he's particularly a creature of habit. So he picks up. If I'm talking in a way that suddenly you find a little inspirational, that's your elephant saying, yeah, I like that. I want to become that person. But the problem is he's such a creature of habit. Once we get out the door, he goes back to the old ways. And so we need to motivate the elephant as well as the rider on top. Now, the rider on top is important. That's why Bible teaching is so important. But preaching is also important as a slightly different, deeper, more rounded bringing of the word of God to God's people because it speaks to the elephant as well. It, It inspires and motivates the elephant. But we also need to adopt new habits to help him change his ways. And you know, one of the things the elephant likes is the big picture. He likes to be inspired. And you know, what was this uh, Antoine de Saint Exupéry said? Look, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and just give orders. You've got to do that. But instead, he says, Teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So we need to, you know, get the wood in and, and, and the carpentry, give orders. That's going to be part of it. But if you really want to do this, teach the men to yearn to go to 
to see. And that's what we need to do with the elephant because becoming people of gratitude will orientate our heart, will order our heart rightly to its true home, its true destiny, which is to magnify the glory of God and to be part of that glory. And as we said yesterday, and as we'll say tomorrow, and as we'll say on Thursday, the glory of the call of God is that he calls us to be a significant part of his story, to play a unique role in his story. That There are tasks within the building of the kingdom of God that are yours to do and just yours to do. Play your unique role into this story. But the story is not about you. What a blessing that is. To be part of a story that's not, how flat, how gray, a story about you. No, no, this is the story of the glory of God. And I hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor the, man, the mind of man conceive what God has in store for those who love him. Gratitude orders our hearts rightly toward their true home, which is the glory of God. And that's how we motivate the elephant. View of this truth about God, therefore, as God's people, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Colossians 3.12, and over all these virtues, put on love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Amen. Well, may God help us digest some of, some of these thoughts. Um, we've got some time for questions now. So... There's a mic here. It looks as if they're expecting a very, very tall person there. So somebody might like, oh no, it's all right. Yes, good, good. Good yes. morning. Um, thank you very much. Very, very helpful. Could I ask you a psychiatric question? I, you can ask the question. I'm not, I may not answer it, but you can try the question, yeah. For those people who are diagnosed with serious and enduring mental health conditions, the psychiatrically ill, is it helpful for them to know that people like Prince Harry are now deemed to have had mental illness? Right. Um, I just, where, where does the thankful, the gratitude bit come in? Um, Sorry, just saying with our topic. I'm just anxious to say with our topic. It's a great question, actually. Answer it another time. <laughs> Look, I'm going, to, I'm going to give it a quick answer. Um, I think it's hugely helpful, to be honest, because not, I'm not so much interested in, in Prince Harry, but I think it's terribly important that people with severe mental disorders or people actually with less severe mental disorders, which will touch many of us, here in terms of depression, anxiety, do not see themselves as being under some stigma of difference to other people. You know, I, I, I once um, heard a voice in the night. Someone called my name. It was me calling my name, Glenn. And I sat up um, because it, it wasn't uh, as if I heard it, I heard it through my ears. And it wasn't a dream. And I thought, goodness me, I've been talking ab about and teaching and working with people who hear voices many years. And I've been saying, it's not something they're imagining, it's something they experience. It's a breakdown of the normal processes within the psyche of information processing. And it's a can be a cruel and frightening experience. But fortunately for me, I know that 15 to 20% of people, ordinary people, have this experience. It's called a hypnagogic hallucination, you see. 
but it opened my eyes to the world of mental disorder. And I found myself saying to patients subsequently, not always, if it was appropriate, if it fitted the circumstances, you know, I think I get a little of, of what you're telling me. But what you need to know is, is, is you've got a lot of what most of us, for most of the time, have a little of. But you're not in a different box from us. You've got more of what we all struggle with at times. And it's so important that people who are mentally ill do not feel that stigma of being excluded from the community as so radically unhuman and different. Now, I, I don't want to go off piste again if I might, so if I could ask that questions stay on our topic, that would be um, wonderful. Um, and uh, we've got another one here, thank you. And do come and just, just wait, wait if you've got a question and I'll be glad to have a go at it. Hi there, uh, what is the difference between an attitude of, or a posture of gratitude, and then sort of this sort of positivity, you know, where you meet Christians who, or just other folks who are just very positive about things and almost, it, it feels fake actually. Sorry, you were? Um, it feels fake, you know, when people are just very positive. So that difference between being positive and being thankful and having a, an attitude of gratitude. Right. I think, you're, I think you're asking, are you saying that we need to become kind of power of positive thinking people? Is, is that? Or I, yeah, I think, is, is there a problem with that? Can, yes, yes, good. No, no, I get that. Thank you very much. Yeah, we don't want to become power of positive thinking people where we pursue this goal for its own sake. We're pursuing the goal because it makes us feel better, you know? That's the end of all this, to cheer up my life. Two reasons. First of all, it's not true that everything's marvelous and positive. And one of the wonderful things of the scripture is it doesn't try to convince us it is. That's the glories of the psalm. You'll find if you're hurting kindred spirits in scripture, there's plenty of wonderful writers like C.S. Lewis who have that graphic picture of the door slammed in your face and bolting and double bolting. So... Nothing in our scriptures would lead us to this happy power of positive thinking. What we're talking about here is correcting the balance within the psyche. And whilst being real about what dealing with hard circumstances is, learning to be thankful in all circumstances, it, it doesn't mean that this isn't still hurting, but it puts it into a bigger context and I think that's what's really important here because it's not about us in the end it's about the glory of God. Thank you so much. Uh, my sister was also wanting some big recommendations on sort of gratitude if you have any. Yes um, and I, I'm going to recommend one or two books at the end of the week that'll that, that will sum up from, from most of the references I've made. I'll try and get them up and get them distributed. Okay thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for this morning. Um, some advice. I, I'm a glass half empty sort of person, like you, and I've read and listened to what you've been saying, which has been tremendously helpful. Planning to go home and to change my attitude to one of gratitude, but there will be people at home, both in the family and around the church and other places, who will uh, not expect me or allow me to change. I wonder if you've got any advice for how I might... Uh, <laughs> how I might tell my mum that I'm not always going to be just like my father and <laughs> might, might tell other people who would want me to remain the same because it's more comfortable yeah, what a, for them. Yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to... Um, uh, I'm not going to obviously have anything to say about your personal situation, but it's a good question in the round, isn't it? Because none of us are functioning in, a, in, in isolation. We're enmeshed in systems and sometimes those systems have scripted and continue to script us to see the world in certain ways. One of the ways I, I find that's really helpful in counseling is to get someone to, to, con to tell their story and to see it as a, a story and spend time just talking through, and this is your story, and then to unearth 
script lines that seem to recur over and over again, you see. And often those script lines have been written in our very earliest experience. You are here to live up to other people's expectations. I remember a Christian worker once who, who, who was going to leave their work because they'd watched their pastor father brutalize their brother and them. And yet they shared so many of his temperaments, his, his characteristics in other areas of life. And there was always the unspoken but their script in the family that you'll turn out like your dad. And he'd lost his temper with one of his kids one day and frightened so much. He said, I've got to leave ministry. I cannot become like him, you see. So, so it's a wonderful thing to be able to unearth the scripts that drive our story. And then to say, so do you want to change that script? Because that's a pen in your hand. You don't have to keep writing the same lines going forward, but only if you want to change. Now, let God into this. Let Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Hear what God wants you to be and how he wants this script to change. And the wonderful thing about noticing a script is that you can then change it under God. That is the very hallmark of the Christian Life, So um, I, I think what, what one has to do is very gently, and it, I'm not going to suggest it's easy, but those people, they've got to get used to a different you, a different way of being in the world. And, uh, and that's not going to be easy, but that's what you have to do. Yeah. Ben. I've come across a, a journaling question, which is, well, there are two. One is what moment in the day are you most grateful for, but also the opposite, what moment in the day are you least grateful for? Uh, and that has been immensely helpful for people to realize what they really want to change, even though they haven't changed it. I don't know whether that, that's... That's that actually, a, that's a really nice point, um, because we don't have to follow the Robert Eman model where we just count the blessings. We can too, by noticing the thing we're least grateful for, recontextualize that within the thing that we're grateful for, which always points us to God, you know. You know, I'll, I'll mention this on Thursday, Pollyanna, you know, Pollyanna, she, she had this thing, it, it was always, well, at least this happened, you know, and, and what she was, could do, uh, whilst there's a naivety about this, what her gift was, was whatever went wrong, she could always say, well, at least there was this good thing, and there is something quite psychologically healthy about that. So I think noticing the thing you're least grateful for is, is, uh, does create the possibility of reshaping it within God's bigger plan for me. It may be I can't see what it's about, I can't see why God's brought that into my life just now, but I'm gonna trust his purposes are good for me. You know, so. thank, you. thank you so much, that's a great point actually. Morning. You mentioned um, several times over the last couple of days. So I, can you, you mentioned uh, just pull it down a bit if you can. Right. That's it. Yeah. You mentioned several times over the last couple of days that basically our personality is often a mixture of genetics and experience, and of course, particularly childhood experience. Um, most modern parenting manuals, secular and Christian, will talk about the importance of a praise culture. The importance of a praise culture. A praise, praise culture. Praising the child. Oh, I see praising, yes, yeah. Um, do you, it's fair, I should think, to assume that children that live in a praise culture also live in a gratitude culture, but praise is very me-centred. Is there any research you know of for children about being in more of a gratitude culture than a praise culture? Yes, um, the, I've, I've written, I, there's a book I wrote called uh, The Big Ego Trip. Uh, and it's still published by IVP if anyone wanted to follow up on that. But there's a chapter in that called Kids Praise. And it, it's, it's about our culture, which is about endless praise. You know, you get a medal just for turning up at the race, let alone winning it. Um, and it's coming from a, it's well-intentioned. It's coming from a good place. 
But um, the problem with endless praise for a kid is that it sets them up in a way that they then begin to want to avoid failure at all costs. You know, you're special. Hey, what have we got here, a little Mozart or not? He only banged out, you know, a couple of notes on the piano. Um, gosh, you're going to be somebody. This is, you know, this is a, a cross we impose on our kids when we boost them in this way. And there's some nice research, uh, Carol Dweck, that I cite in, in the book, uh, in which she shows that if you overpraise kids and you're not realistic, of course you always do it within a, you always make your um, comments, feedback to a kid as to yourself within a context of encouragement. You know, that's always the case. But if you overpraise in this boosting kind of way, in one of her trials, she found that children overboosted and overpraised avoided difficult tasks and scored less well than others because they didn't want the shame of not being the little Mozart they were supposed to be, and so they're risk avoidant. We, don't want, we want our kids to grow up confident to go out and, and make something of the world and bring their unique gifts to it, as well as acknowledging their weaknesses and their sinfulness and their, you know, their struggles, but overall, just boosting is a kind of a secular answer that I think is a psychological cul-de-sac. It's a great question, though, and there's lots of work, more reading one could do around that. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Yeah. One last question there. Thank you. Sorry, brother. I think the... Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> on the topic of mental health, I know almost all of us knowing somebody struggling with that. As much as I personally appreciate these topics, I really do, um, is there a danger in us walking away with our awe walk and our gratitude journal and just blindly prescribing it with good intentions to our loved ones and our friends? And if so, how would you navigate that? Yeah, great question. If, if anyone's hearing me suggesting that these are panaceas, can I please disabuse you of that now? You know, these are not panaceas. Do you remember we showed, we, sh we showed even in terms of personality, Genetics, you can't change it. This is what makes change a tough walk. Circumstances you can't control. There, is, there are things we can do, however, to help. And, uh, you know, we live in a world that loves panaceas. You know, the, the most recent panacea is mindfulness, isn't it? You know, mindfulness. This, this is the history of psychology. Something comes in and it's the best thing since sliced bread and everybody's using it. If you look on the BBC website, just in the past 10 days, there's a report of a huge or big rather multi-center study on the rollout of mindfulness in schools, finding that it has none of the benefits hoped for. So, I, you know, I just want to underscore that there are no panaceas in a fallen world. There's the long, slow journey of formation and discipleship. But what awe and gratitude do is they help order our hearts toward their true goal and keep us going toward that. Thank you so much, everybody. Can I just pray for us and then we'll better finish. Lord, bless you, our great, good God. We're just creatures, Lord just creatures. Thank you that your word tells us that as a father, you have compassion for you know that we are dust. And so out of our dustiness, we lift our hearts to you and we pray that you'll continue your walk, your work, helping us to to order our hearts toward the glory of our own destiny, which is to be lost in the glory of our God. We pray these things. Just pray for each other, for any folks struggling. If I've overstated something or understated, Holy Spirit, come and correct this work in our hearts. We pray as we commit it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.